right, here we are, folks. This is a special podcast. It's not really uh, on our normal schedule, but we have a special guest in town. I'm joined with Luke Riches from Matchroom Sport. And uh, Luke, we're going to give you plenty of time to plug your event here in a minute. Thank you very much. Just have a few things to take care of. It is Friday, May 22nd, 2015. And uh, Luke is here to talk about the upcoming Moscone Cup, uh, as well as a couple other things. But first, I want to let everybody know about some upcoming events that we have. The 2015 New England Regional Championships is May 29 through 30 at Boston Billiard Club in Nashua, New Hampshire. There's a flyer which can be downloaded on our website at playcsipool.com. Go there for all the information. We also have a brand new event coming up in Tucson, Arizona. This is the inaugural event. It's the 2015 Nationals warm-up that will be at Casino del Sol. Brand new event. And that will be June 10 through 14. This is your last chance to warm up for our national championships. And we will have high-definition live streaming using the same arena, same equipment that we use on the pros. Come on out. It'll be a lot of fun. Uh, I'll actually be there, and I'm going to embarrass myself by playing. And again, right behind that, we do have the BCA Pool League and USA Pool League National Championships. That's July 22 through August 1st. That is at the beautiful Rio All Suite Hotel and Casino in Las Vegas, Nevada. I want to emphasize this to everybody. Uh, anyone can play in the BCAPL National Championships. It's always best to be a BCA Pool League member, but... Uh, some people live in areas that don't have a league, so we have an avenue for you. All you have to do is purchase a CSI membership, and you can play in any of the Scotch doubles and singles events, depending on your skill level. Uh, but it's an avenue to where anybody can play. So don't think that you have to be a league member to come out and participate. Also, I want to remind everybody that late fees begin on June 9th. That's not far away, folks. We don't want your late fee. It's not a source of revenue. We'd rather you get your entries in well ahead of time. So get your entries in before June 9th so you can avoid that late fee. Do want to thank our sponsors for the BCAPL and USAPL National Championships. Viking Cues is the official cue of those events. And I'd also like to thank Omega Billiard Products. They are the official store of those events. And again, we'll show the, uh, it, you won't be able to see it very well on the screen, but I want to show the schedule of events that we'll have at the Rio. Lots of events for everybody, over 41 events, I believe. Uh, again, this schedule can be downloaded from our website, playcsipool.com. And it shows the days that every event occurs, the overlaps that take place. Again, all the information is on our website. So that leads us into the 2015 U.S. Open 10-Ball, U.S. Open 8-Ball Championships. That's July 24th through the 31st at the Rio. These events are held alongside uh, our amateur events. 15000 added to each event. Uh, assuming full fields, the total prize fund for both events, $107,000. That's nothing to sneeze at. And again, uh, this will be something near and dear to your heart, Luke. Both of these events are Team USA Moscone Cup points events. And I'll, Luke, I'll let you explain what that means in just a second. Uh, again, these, uh, both events are limited to 128 players, open to anyone, no skill level restrictions. Entry fee is only $350 each. And I'd like to thank our sponsors for the U.S. Open Championships events. Predator is the official queue. Kamui is the official tip, and again, Omega is the official store of those events. So show your appreciation to our sponsors by giving them your business. So now I'm going to shut up. I'm going to let Luke take over and let him talk about the upcoming Moscone Cup. Okay, yeah, well, we're December the 7th to the 10th at the Tropicana. Uh, it's a new venue for us, so I spent the last couple of days there, and it's, I feel it's going to work really well there. I think... Um, the people who work, who'll be working on the event, there's a kind of a bit of a love for the event. They, they, they're not used to sports events, but they're, uh, they're really, really quite keen on it. And I think uh, they spent, I think, $200 million refitting the Tropicana. 
and uh, it's, it's a really lovely place and I think it's, uh, it's, it's really going to work well for us there. Now you've been at MGM Properties yep. in the past. I think you were at MGM last time you were in the States two years ago you were at the Mirage. That's correct, yeah. Uh, why the move? Was there a um, need for it or just kind no, of evolved we, that way? We, 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 we asked, we, uh, we went back to the MGM group and, uh, and basically they, they couldn't find uh, um, they couldn't find a room for us um, and, t and time was running out and we we knew the Tropicana from a few years back they came to look at the event so we we went to see them and they were just straight away they were happy to take the event and you know we've got a quite a good deal with them and it, it's, it's a bit more intimate than the, the, the MGM Grand or the Mirage and you know we're gonna we're gonna have a Moscone Cup bar in there for the event you know Moscone Cup cocktails for each team we're gonna have it all branded up and you know they're really keen to make a really good show of it and uh, we're building uh, just a fraction over a thousand seat arena which is about half sold so far with you know quite a long time to go um, and yeah I, th I think you know we're all very excited about going to the Tropicana. Good good so how can people buy tickets? They can go to the Tropicana website troplv.com which is the sole um, source of tickets and it's quite an easy process to purchase them online. Okay, all right. And how do people watch uh, either in Europe or in the United States? Uh, in, the, in Europe, it's live on Sky Sports. I think it's live on Sport One in Germany and it's on in, live in a couple of other territories. Last time it was on ESPN3, I believe, um, which I suspect is where it will be going again this time. All right, so I, I'm a little ignorant on ESPN3. Is that like a streaming thing it's, only? Yeah, it's, or? It's, a, it's, a, it's a digital platform. Okay. But it obviously can be watched on the smart TV, so it's, um, yeah, so, I mean, they've given us the time on that, and, you know, obviously we'd like to be on ESPN, the main channel, live for four days, but that's not really where we're at with it at the moment, but, you know. I remember hearing Barry Hearn talk at uh, Jeanette Lee's, that's right, it, yeah. it was Barry Hearn's uh, BCA Hall of Fame induction that's and right, Jeanette yeah. Lee's Hall of Fame induction, and he was talking at pretty good length about the challenges of getting pool on ESPN. It's it's difficult, in the US. yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a it, it, it's Sky Sports. Of I mean, the, the event came into being because Sky Sports, you know, wanted you know a pool event which we produced for them back in the day. Um, but it, it's a different kind of business model over here. I mean, m money for rights fees for sport in the, in the USA generally go to you know, a few sports, and everybody else has to sort of scamper around on the outside. But you know, it's, it's not necessarily going to be that way forever. I mean, sometimes you can get a breakthrough or... So, and we're, we're a company that will always just keep on keeping on with things like that. You know, one day it may happen for us. Sure, sure. So, something near and dear to my heart, I have to ask you. What do you say to people that say, uh, out like our events, the U.S. Open 10-ball and 8-ball championships, yeah. they're... They are Moscone Cup points events. First of all, explain what that means. Well, it's, it's a series of events that we've kind of designated that we, we create a ranking system where, whereby players can play in them, get points, and at the end of the series, which is the, the last event is um, the US Open in uh, Chesapeake. US Open 9 yep. Yep. And uh, the, the top three guys on that ranking list will be in the Moscone Cup side. Whoever they are, they will be in the team. And then the other two will be wildcard picks from the captain, Mark Wilson. Okay. So y you guys at Matchroom have created a series of 10? Is it 10 uh, events? Do you know what, for top, I think it's, 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 it's around that, maybe a bit less. It's a number of events, and based on how players finish in, I think it's the top, top, 30, thir top, 32, top, 32, top 32 in every event, earn points on some type of sliding scale. Yeah, you've you've created like tier one, tier two, tier, and tier Yeah, the, the, the lowest scale is on, on seven foot tables, and then the next scale is on um, events on nine foot tables and then the, the, the top event was we designate the US Open because of its strength of field and, and its tradition. Huge added yeah. money, strength of yeah. field, that kind of yeah. thing. Yeah, and that makes sense. So at the end of this series of events, the top three USA players yep. with the most points uh, have automatic berths They're on in, the yeah. USA team. They're in. So what would you say to people that say no event on the seven foot tables should be included in that series? Um, well, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, there's pe people can have by, opinions. By, by the way, folks, I'm cheating because I asked him this question at dinner last night. 
and I'm hoping that he's as animated in his answer today as he was last night. <laughs> I just feel that if there were, if there were 10 events with $70,000 added money on nine foot tables, fine, we'd use them. But you know, this, this is the reality of Paul in America at the moment. Um, and we, we can either not use any events and just pick five players that we've done in the past, or we can give players an opportunity to qualify. And uh, I mean, w one of the other things we're looking at doing is, is perhaps next year expanding the, the number of events. Because with, with the smaller added money events, it can be quite financially punitive for players who have to travel entirely across the country, for, which we understand that, but we have to put something in place. But I think next year we might do have a lot more events involved, more regional events. So players, obviously with smaller points attached to them, but it means that players can, will always have events sure, to play. Sure, it could be a tier four yeah, or tier and include, five. Yeah, and include bigger international events because obviously, you know, I know American players don't necessarily go to the China Open or the, the World Nine Ball, but some do. And if one of them was to win it, it, it should count for something. Sure. Rather than increase their chances of having a wild card pick, it should actually give them some points. Um, so we, we're kind of working on that at the moment, but I think it's something that we'd, we'd like to have in place, you know, um, you know, by the autumn or the fall. But Luke, surely you guys at Matchroom are smart enough to know that by playing events on seven foot tables, somebody like me is going to make the team. That's going to happen, right? Yeah, well, yeah. I, I don't think so. I mean, I think it's, <laughs> I think we, 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 you know, we had this in snooker where some, some changing, they were changing the formats and some of the snooker tournaments had, had much shorter races and a lot of people said, oh, it's, it's going to, you know, it's going to open it up and that. But it was the same guys that, that were in the, you know, the last eight and the, the semi-finals and the winner. And I think, you know, with, with seven foot tables, I know maybe it's not ideal, but it, you, you can't tell me that the, that the guys who, you know, if you look at the, uh, the, the US, the, the, the um, bar table championships, I mean, who, who won all the events there? Yeah, you know, I've, ma I've made this point on prior podcasts as well. The same guys win. Yeah. It's, it's still the Shanes. It's the Warren Kiamko. It's the Darren. It's the Corey Duell. Those, the cream rises to the top, folks. It doesn't matter if you're playing on a 10-foot table, a 9-foot table, 7-foot table. You could play on almost anything. And, yeah, uh, Luke and I had this discussion last night. On a 7-foot table, uh, I'll concede the fact that the weaker player has a slightly better chance of winning a given match. No question about it. But over the course of a tournament, that weaker player is not likely to win that tournament. It's just not going to happen. It's too tall of an order. Somebody like me, I can beat one of those top guys in a match here or a match there. Through the course of a tournament with 64, 100, 200 players, it's just not going to happen. The cream rises to the top. The past history and statistics back that up, and it's just no way around it. And I think uh, this year's team, make a prediction, I think this year's team will be much better uh, the score will indicate that it's much better than the team we had last year. What do you think? Who's going to win? I mean, you know, pe people, we, we want the, you know, I can't make no secret of it, we want the USA to win. It's, you know, it's our event. Look, you know. come on, I've read on AZ Billiards that you're, it's a conspiracy against the USA. Well, and yeah, but we, we, you know, we look at it, it's our event. We want, you know, the Euro Europeans have won it, what, six of the last seven times, and, you know, it, it it do, from a neutral spectator, you, if, you, if you know he's going to win an event in advance, it, in the end it has no interest. So we really want the, the USA to be sort of resurgent in this event. And, and to, when people say that they haven't got the players, the players aren't as good and you know, they're not as schooled, and so, you know, I don't go for that. I think there's plenty of good players in the USA. Um, you know, they just need galvanizing, and which I think is, is arguably could happen this year. Um, you know, and I, I just think there's some experienced players, there's some young players. You know, I just think they've, that there's some really great players in the United States. Um, and they, maybe they've got a bit of a downer on themselves at the moment. But, you know, I'm sure, I really believe they can, they, can, they can win this event. So when the dust settles, who do you think the top three will be? Um, well, I'm going to really stick my neck out and I'm going to say Shane Van Boning. Really? You think so? Yeah. Um, if Shane doesn't make it, what's the chance of Mark Wilson? Mark Wilson picking Shane as well, one of the two wildcards. Well, that's cards. a very good question, that, because Shane's, Shane's record in the event is, is not, not as probably as great as he'd like it to be. Um, and last year, I think even by his own admission, he'd say he had a, a really disappointing time. But 
it would be really hard to, to go into the event um, without Shane in the United States side. Um, you know, there's other guys like you know, like Scott Frost is is uh, is up there now. You know, he's never played in the event. You know, he he could be. You know, he, he can Scott Frost can play Paul without a shadow of a doubt. And you know, he might be the sort of character that like when in when they last won it in 2009 when. Dennis Hatch just, you know, played lights out Paul and really got into the event. You know, you could see a guy like Scott Frost doing that, but, you mm. know, he's got a, he's, gonna, he's probably, I should imagine he's going to play in all the events and, you know, he's probably got a great chance, but um, I don't know. And, and there's, you know, who else? Mike Deshane. I think Mike Deshane's, he's played in two Moscone Cups. I think he's probably a different type of guy than he was then. Um, and I think he's probably, you know, he's got a, he's got a great chance of getting in the side this year. And, and, and doing well in the event. And, you know, you even can't discount guys like Johnny Arch, who's, who's still out there. And, you know, Johnny, Johnny had a bad time of it in 2000 and, um, 2013. But the year before in London, you know, he, he, was, he won the most points of any player in, in the event. So, you know, and he's got a great his, history with the event and a lot of experience. And there's a lot, you know, the young players like Justin Hall and Bergman and Skylar Woodward and guys like that, you know, they're, they're all in with a chance. And, uh, you know, and, uh, and we'd love to see him have a, t a team that could, could go out there and do it. I can't wait. No. I'm going to be there in person. Um, anything else to say about the Moscone Cup before we get um, to the questions? No, not really. I mean, it's it's a great event. It's it's it, 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 but it does need it needs the United States to, you know, it needs everyone to come and get behind the team because I think I think that's in in recent years that's been a. A, a big part of the European success is the is the support that they have, you know, and it's kind of um, it's sort of unconditional support. People, you know, they buy their tickets. They don't know who's on the team. They just want to go right. and get behind their team. And um, and it, it, it really, you know, you talk to the players in the side, and they, you know, they really do appreciate it. I think another great uh, aspect of this point system that you guys have rolled out this year is that it creates some synergy here in the U.S. So you guys have slated a series of, we'll just say, 10 events. And those are different promoters. Q Sports International is one of them. Uh, Barry Berman and the U.S. Open Nine Ball. Mike Zuglin and the two Turning Stone yeah. events. You have uh, Alan Hopkins and the Players' Championship. Yeah. So you have all these independent tournaments that would otherwise operate completely independent. And then you have Match Room that comes in. And you guys have sort of the uh, year-ending event, and it's a big yeah. event. The Moscone Cup is not a made-for-junk TV tournament, like I've heard some people say. It is really the pinnacle of the year, and it's exciting, and it's fun to watch. So now you have this series of events with all these different promoters. So now they want to promote the Moscone Cup. Yeah. And in turn, you want to promote all these other events, and you want people to play in all these other events. So it really does, in my opinion, help solidify the industry a little bit and help get people to work together yeah and I, I, I just I do think that for next year if we can get more and more events involved in this because there's lot you know there's a lot of regional tours that have a you know have a big tour championship type event there's you know there's, there, there, there's lots of tournaments and um, you know that we would we would consider and you know you, and you may you may have a list of you know 15 to 20 tournaments and you know not every player is going to play in every one and the points, you know, if you win an event, a smaller event, regional event, it's not going to give you enough points to get in it. But if a player plays in enough of the events and does well enough, well enough in them, he, he will get, you know, get his spot. Sure, I, I, purely selfish, but uh, I like the regional tour yeah. idea because some players, like you said, they can't really travel all over the country no. or all over the world, and even if there's smaller points attached to it, uh, it helps. Because yeah, some yeah. of these tours are very tough. Yeah, you look at Tony Robles up in New York, his tour, very tough. Um, shameless plug, action pool tour on the East Coast. Uh, Oscar Dominguez has his tour yeah, out here I mean, on the West Coast. You know, they're all competitive. And you look, yeah. at, you, know, you look at the guys who win it, win these events, and you know, they're, they're top players. Right, right. All right, Well, how about we take a few questions from go AZ on, Billiards? Yeah. You're going to be animated, right? Yeah, go on. All right. Fire away. Green Hornet, who is actually a personal friend of mine um, and will be on our crew this year in Las Vegas. Okay. He says, why have the, all these questions are for you, by the way. Nobody wants to hear from me anymore. Why have the nine on the spot? What's the, re, what's the purpose that's behind a, that? That's a good question. It, 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 it's, a, it's a historical thing. Um, it, w when we used to have a, the soft break, which 
was kind of really it was really disappointing. But you know, play, players you know they're there to do what they can to try and win the match. But by moving it up, obviously it eliminated the wing ball going into the corner pocket. But then you know, obviously players can work other things with it. But it, it, that, that's where it stayed, and and uh, and uh, I guess it's going to stay there for the moment. I mean, last year the break in the Moscone Cup worked really well. It was we had no restrictions that you could break break behind the head string. There was no three point rule, and players hit the balls. There was no cut breaks, and 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 it was um, you know, and it, and it worked well. Didn't you have a rule too that a certain number of balls had to go beyond? Yeah, well, that was that was called the three, the kind of the three point rule where you had to either pocket or get three balls past the the head string, and uh, it was quite exciting that rule. But it, it, it could be harsh sometimes because you know somebody would make a good break and there was a you know collision. I and do re I do remember there. seeing that one time. I don't remember which player it was, but they absolutely crushed the rack. I mean, they hit it. Yeah. It looked like as hard as they possibly could. And there was a foul called, and I, I had to do a double take, like, yeah. foul for what? And, and it was just that. Three balls didn't go beyond yeah. the history. Yeah, it, it, it does happen. But it was, um, it, it, you know, the, the problem with, with um, the, these sort of break rules is that they're all a little bit contrived because, you know, players will figure something out and then you kind of make a rule to try and stop it. And, and then and they you, figure that out. And uh, yeah, and then, then, then ten ball comes along, but then in the end they figure out the break on that and... And it, it, it just, it, it kind of never ends. But, I mean, it was interesting uh, uh, at the Moscone Cup in, when we were here a, a couple of years ago. We, um, they broke from a really narrow break box. And the nine was on the spot and they hit the ball's head on hard. No cut breaks. And, um, and, and just nobody made any balls on the break. So it was all about, all about the shots after that. You know, there was, no, there was like two or three break and runs in the entire event. Um, but yeah, it was, um, it's quite an interesting thing because everybody thinks they know. Yeah, I mean, I'm, you know, I don't play pool, but you know, I spend enough time with pool players in, in, in the sport. But everybody thinks they know the answer to it, and probably nobody does. Well, when you find the answer, it just changes. Oh, yeah. So. Yeah. Um, this is one that you might have some comments on. This is also from Green Hornet. Talk about the cultural differences that you see between USA and Europe in pool? Well, I think in Europe it's, it's a little bit more structured. Um, I think pool in the USA is like crying out for some sort of structure um, for which to work around. Um, I mean, the BCA, which is the governing body, really don't have a whole lot of involvement in it, if at all. Um, I mean, even in Europe, it, it, I think a lot of people in America think that in Europe it's marvellous and there's loads of tournaments and that. But it's not really quite like that. I mean, the Euro Tour is regular events, mm -hmm. um, but you know they're not particularly lucrative. You know, it's, it, it's it, it costs a lot of money. You know, traveling around Europe it costs a lot of money. Um, you know, and European players go to to world events in say China or the Middle East. You know, th th again, they're they're very expensive. Um, but yeah, they just seem they just seem, it just seems to have a little more structure to it in Europe than it does in the USA. What what about uh, so more structured? But what about culturally? Do, do, are there different attitudes in the USA and Europe um, rega in regards to pool? I mean, I, c I, can, only, I can only judge it on, on the events that I'm involved, involved in, but um, um, not, not really. I mean, I, I, I suppose in, in, in the USA, there's much more of a, a gambling history to pool. I think a lot of European players, you know, their, their background is, is not in gambling. It's, it's probably in a more form. They, they, were, they came into the game in a more... Um, structural way than 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 gambling, right? Um, but you know, in in the end, you know, a lot of sport. I mean, imagine something like the sport like golf back in the day in the sort of nineteen forties and fifties. You know, that probably had loads of gambling. which probably doesn't have it now. But you know, sports change, and and um, you know, people you know, gambling is a, is a part of a lot of sports. You know, people it's a it's a measure, isn't it? You know, and sure. You know, a lot of people look. You know, people talk about Shane that playing Shane in a long race is the ultimate test of a pool player which may be true but obviously in tournaments you're not playing race to 100 you're playing race to 10 or something but right yeah I mean they're not that far apart but yeah I think there's there's just the background in in, in gambling which I don't think really existed in in Europe okay um, also from Green Hornet any chance or have you even thought about 
the possibility of having female players in the Moscone Cup? Mm, th well, we, ha we, ha we have had female players in the Moscone Cup in the first, um, the first time we ever did it. I had uh, Jeanette Lee and Vivian Villarreal for the United States and Alison Fisher before she was a pool player and Francisca Stark for Europe. But no, I don't think we would. I don't think it would, I don't think it would bring anything to the event. Um, you know, I just think it would, it would probably, you know, I'm not knocking women players at all, but I just think it would probably dilute the event slightly. So I don't think it's anything that's on our agenda at all. Gotcha. Johnny T. Uh, <laughs> we talked about this. Uh, will the USA team ever include Canada? And I, you know, this kind of goes back to a few comments that you and I have both probably read where uh, the assertion is that the Moscone Cup is really not fair because you have USA, one country, versus Europe, a whole collection of countries. Yeah. So what would you say to that? Well, I, I, no, first of all, we wouldn't include Canada, no. I mean, the event's Europe versus the USA, and I'm not sure there's anything particular Canada could bring to the party. And it would just it would dilute the brand, then. It wouldn't be Europe versus USA. It would be Europe versus USA and Canada. But, um, yeah, it's... Um, when you look at Europe, it's obviously it's, it's a lot. It's a collection of countries, but you know, look at a country like England or, or the UK. Number of sort of players who seriously play nine ball or, or, or ten ball or whatever on, on a regular basis at a high level. It's probably no more than a few hundred. You know, a lot of European countries don't play at all in all so of Europe. Yeah, so so just in terms of active players in in Europe, there's probably less than there are in the USA. I'm, I'm saying that I don't know for a fact, but. You know, I think there's a perception that, that everybody plays pool in Europe, so but, but it's, it's not the case at all. You know, other countries, you know, there's, you know, Germany has a lot of pool activity. It's a, Germany's a really, really um, structured country. That, you know, there's league play. You know, all these guys like Ralph Suke play in, you know, for, for leagues in the Bundesliga. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and play countries like Holland, are, you know, they, they're state-supported. I mean, they don't, the players don't get fortunes from the government, but, you know, they get... X's, X's to go and play in the European Championships and World Championships and stuff like that, which obviously helps and it's something that doesn't exist in the USA, although it used to probably up to, in, in the old, when we first were involved in the old, beat in the, when we did the World Championship, American players have always got a, a, you know, a, 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 a sort of a stipend from the BCA, like a two or three thousand dollars to cover their costs of going to mm -hmm. the World Championship, which doesn't exist anymore. You know, and all those things help, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard to say, but I, d I don't think uh, you know the events because the USA have, have been having a poor time of it in in recent years. I don't think that's a, a reason to, to to change to change the event because I don't think and people talk about doing like a you know maybe Europe v Asia, but I don't think I I don't think that just feels like a different event. Well, it was a different event. I don't think Asia would have that sort of team camaraderie because it's it would be peak guys. They wouldn't have a common language and and I, I just you know I'm sure they could. Do put up a decent team, don't, no doubt about that. But you know, from our point of view, I don't that's, that wouldn't help our event at all. So I have a question, and you can answer it or you can pass. Go on. So we're, you, you mentioned team camaraderie, and you and I had a discussion last night over dinner about, uh, for lack of a better term, the locker room, the team room. Yeah. Can you describe how USA's team room was different than Europe's team room? Um, yeah, it, 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 I think a lot of it goes down to the captain, and a lot of people think people say, "Oh, the captain's not important." You know, they're players and they should be able to play. But <coughs> in team sports, you know, a leader, a recognised leader, without a doubt, is a is a, a critical person in a, in, a, in a sports team. And I, I think that um, that Johan, when he was the European captain, um, was was really well organised, really highly professional, and well organised. And that worked for him, and that worked for the European players. You know, sometimes you get players who maybe didn't like each other that much, but you know, he got them to put anything, everything aside for the four days of the event, and he got and he get he got a lot out of players, especially young players who'd not mm -hmm. played in it before. Um, and I d didn't see the didn't see the USA particularly like that, but you know, it, 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 it just just because it worked it works for one thing doesn't mean it works for another. I mean, this year we've got. Um, Marcus Shamat, captain in Europe, who's like a, a great guy. He's played in the Moscone Cup a few times, and he's a real catch, and he's a really popular player. You know, I've never 
heard anyone say a bad word about him. You know, and Marcus, he's not going to be like Johan Reising. He won't be anything like that. It'd be entirely different how he approaches it and what he does and how, how, he, how he works with the players. And, and that's down to him. He's got, he's mm -hmm. got to play to his strengths. Um, and I think Mark last year did, um, you know, he, he did a good job. He was, un he was under a lot of pressure and, and he, he kind of made a stand by picking a, a certain... He, I think he wanted, to, he wanted players who were going to... <coughs> excuse me, who would play for him. You know, he didn't want players who might, he felt might be difficult, but obviously now he's, he's in his second year of the job, he's, you know, he's going to be looking at, at every, everyone and anyone who he thinks can do a job for him. Sure. Um, but, yeah, the, you know, the, the, the locker room and how, how the teams are. You know, when, when the last time the USA won it in, t in 2009, you know, they were, it was just their, their, their locker room was, you know, just on fire. You know, they were winning matches. And, it, you know, in the end, when you start winning matches in an event like that... Makes you know, things easier, doesn't it? Of course it does, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yep. All right. Um, next is from Pink Lady. And I'm going to read this sentence, and I want to get your reaction to it. Go on. All right. Let's assume for a moment that the U.S. Open nine ball doesn't happen. What is Matchroom's plan B regarding points? So let me get your reaction on that, well, and I'll I mean, read the rest of it. Yeah, I mean, I, we don't, we haven't got a plan B on the basis the U.S. Open is not going to happen because we've got no, absolutely no reason to believe that that, that it won't happen. Well, and, and if it were to happen, I would assume that you just that event's just not on the series. Not, yeah, you, don't, you can only do what's. So you take the the points lists as it was prior to the U.S. Open, <coughs> and that would be your final points list. So. That, that would be, I mean, it's it'd be unfortunate, but I, I mean, I, it's, it's a very hypothetical question. Now, here's the, here's the part that I really want to get your reaction on. Is there any way that you can announce at least a few of Team USA sooner than November 1? The team will determine if we all attend again. Having more than 30 days notice helps with cost. No, I, I, I you understand. and I talked about this yeah, last I understand night, that. so it's I mean, kind it's of ironic that we got fair, this question. It's a fair question, but the reality is with the team, the, the team, the top three in the rankings won't be determined until when the US Open finishes. And obviously the two wildcard picks can't be determined until <coughs> the captain knows who the three who get the spots by the qualifications. So realistically, it's... Uh, you know, I mean, you, you're probably going to, you could probably say from here that Shane's going to be in it. I'll, I'll go out on a limb and say that. But really realistic, sticking your neck out <coughs> yeah, there. Yeah, but, but, but really, it, it, it's not possible to name any players until the qualification thing's finished. I mean, and I mean, if, that, if, that, um, if that's the reason, if, if, there's, if there's one player or somebody that you don't like in the team, which causes you not to go, then that, that's obviously your decision, but I mean, I just look at the European fans, you just buy their tickets and they worry about the team later and then they're going to come over and support the team. And I mean, realistically, I can't think there's going to be a team of players that you, that you don't like. I mean, there might be one player, you might think, well, he, he, I'd prefer him over him, but that's the same with any team sport. When, you know, when the lineups announced for the starting in the, in the, you know, the England football team, all, all you get is people going, oh, he shouldn't be in it, oh, he should be in it. He should be it, but once the match starts, then everyone's behind the team. Right, and you know I agree with something you said last night, and uh, this kind of goes back to the cultural differences between USA and Europe. And I, we've all seen it, whether we want to admit it or not. But and you just said it to some extent just now. But the European fans, they're going to root for Europe no matter what. They're going to yeah. make the travel across the pond mm. and they're going to watch and they're going to be in attendance. They were at the Mirage a couple of years ago when I was there. Their stands were more full than our stands and we were in Las Vegas. They were into it. They were stomping. They were cheering. They were singing songs about Carl Boys. They were, it, yeah. was, it was an electric atmosphere, atmosphere on that side. On our side, not so much. And that's a shame. And to me, and you don't have to say it, I will, um, it's a shame that our fans won't root for the team. They're going to root for one or two individuals. And if those individuals aren't on the team, then we'll simply avoid the event. I mean, that's and a to shame, me, to be honest. To me, that's a big cultural difference between yeah. USA and Europe. Well, yeah, I mean, what you're saying about the fans singing, all that, there, there is a, 
a quite a well used phrase in, in English sport that says you, you only sing when you're winning. And you know, that time two years ago, Europe were winning pretty much, you know, apart from maybe the first part of the first session. But after that, they were in con control. And when your team's winning and w winning match after match, obviously the, the crowd's right up there. And the, and the opposite crowd is right down there. But I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure if, if the USA got off to a flyer and started winning some matches, you know, the crowd would, would, would I mean, I'm, they're, they're, you know, the, I, I wouldn't knock the American crowd at all. I mean, it's, it's, it is a cultural thing, you know, pe people go to football matches in the UK and, and, and singing and chanting and that sort of stuff is, has always oh, been sure. part of it. But, so, but, you know, I think the, you know, there's a, some, there's a solid uh, block of American support, but, you know, in the end, you, you, you just want something to cheer about and, and, and if your team's getting, getting a pounding, it's, it's, uh, it's quite hard to, to stand up and sing, isn't it, really? But um, I, I agree. Um, however, and I can say this proudly, I'm going to get emails and calls about this. I'm an Oakland Raiders fan. Right. You were making fun of me for that last night. Uh, we haven't had a winning season in, I don't know, 12, 14 know. years. Uh, it's been a long haul. I'm still an Oakland Raiders fan. I still watch the Raiders football games. I still root for them. They're my team, and one day it'll turn around. Um, but the notion that I'm not going to go or not going to watch the event until I know who the players are, I, I don't really share that. Um, to me, I'm going to root for USA, regardless of who the five players are on the team. And it's just the way I feel about it, and it, personally, I wish more people felt that way. Well, yeah, I mean, I, th I think it's... Um you know, I mean, uh, you know, one team could have as much chance as the next team. I mean, it's mm -hmm. it's not like there's there's only five guys that can be in this team because all the all the other five, everyone else is no good. You know, there's 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 lots of players you could could form part of a winning side, and and uh, you know, it's a great event. And uh, for a USA fan, if they come to the Moscone Cup and their team wins, they're going to have the night of their lives on the on the on the Thursday night. I can assure them. Absolutely. I mean, there were there were periods even last year. Of course, it was in. In Lon London, no, right? it was in uh, Blackpool, actually. Blackpool, yeah, okay. The, and there were times where there was a lot of hope on the USA side. Yeah. Right? It wasn't completely over that no, early. I mean, they, uh, and, and it was exciting. Um, they fell away. But boy, that European yeah. team is just tough. Yeah, they are, but they, you know, they, 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 go, they always go into the event with, with a confidence because they won the last one, and it's, that's... You know, you know the, the time before that, in okay, it was a disaster in uh, in Las Vegas in 2013. But the time before that, in in London in 2012, you know, it was 11-9. Right. And you know, they, they had a, you know, when you get to when it's 11-9, that means you're 10-9 down. It means you got you've got a chance. Right. That's that's, that's a close score, and um, you know, it didn't work out for them. But you know, it could it could easily have gone the other way, and. Um, you know, I just think I, I, re I really strongly feel that the USA, <coughs> excuse me, are, are, are not are not far away from getting it together in this event. I agree, and I can't wait for uh, December seven through ten. That's it, yeah. December seven through ten at the Tropicana here in Las Vegas. It's going to be great. You'll be there. I'll be there. Yeah. I'll be there. And uh, anything else to say before we sign off? Um, no, I mean it's it's it, it's if if you've never been to the Moscone Cup before. It's certainly worth going. It's it's not like any other pool tournament. It's it's you know it's a simple concept: Europe versus the USA, and you get behind your country or, or in Europe's case your continent, and and just cheer until you can't make any more noise, and just hope the team just get out there and and do the business. All right, all right, folks. That's it, Luke. Thanks for joining thanks, me. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah. And uh, have a safe trip home. Thanks. See you, folks. <laughs>